Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I, <laughs> I'm joined by Richard Carrier today. And uh, so we're going to talk about some history, and um, that, that is your specialized area. And you've wrote, you, a lot of people know you for what you write about mythicism. You wrote plenty of books, you know, Historicity of Jesus, Jesus in Outer Space. But you've also wrote other books on uh, science in the ancient Roman Empire, the history of science, the history of philosophy, and you've touched on some areas that are pretty important that I think we should uh, address. So there are going to be some super chats piling up. It, I'm not ignoring them. We're going to let them get those submitted. Uh, Richard Carey is going to talk about some of some of these some of these subjects on philosophy and history, and then we're going to go into the super chats. So. Welcome, Ver welcome to the Gnostic Informant, Richard. How are you doing? Yeah, hey, <laughs> glad to be here again. <clears throat> so yeah, go ahead and uh, tell, tell us. Like, let me ask you this: the world seems to be in. It, it seems like in ancient history you have these Platonic ideas of forms of metaphysics, and and then you have the Epicureans who are more rational thinkers. They're more. Um, naturalist thinkers they think of atoms and void it seems like those two branches sort of set the tone for the rest of the way and i might, I might be simplifying too much but yeah not, not too much really uh like you you can put like the two strains of philosophy in history especially western history but at this there's a similar parallel development in chinese eastern history as well uh of this naturalism it's all physics and this mysticism, there's something mystical, supernatural, uh, underlying things, uh, and and both of those trends have have many variants, obviously, uh, but also they gravitate towards a similar to similar things. So to give an example, um, you know, uh, before Christianity, Greek philosophy was had this this split between the supernaturalists and the naturalists, and you have the, the Platonists and the Neoplatonists and so on, and then you have the atomists generally. And you have the Stoics kind of in between. Uh, the Stoic, mo most people talk about Stoic ethics, but the Stoics actually had a really developed metaphysics as well. Uh, they were definitely theists, but they were all about kind of reconciling these two worlds. They were physicalist theists. They thought God's God as one entity that controls the universe does it through a material medium that they called Numa, which is basically their version of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so they had they were trying to like turn it into a science, right? The supernatural into the science. So they were kind of bridging both worlds. But when you see like the play out, Christianity gravitated towards the supernaturalist philosophy. So they they went Platonist. They went very Neoplatonist. Uh, and Pythagoreanism is, is a similar uh, branch of that. But it was mostly Platonism. And then when we got back to going to looking at real science again, you know, when the Middle Ages finally petered out and we actually had a renaissance and then an enlightenment, where did people go? They went to the atomism, right? So uh, they went back to fundamental physics. And so, so you still have the same two trends of the, it's all atoms, whether whatever you mean by atoms, or there is something more. Uh, and that's still the debate today, right? It's still the thing. And like I said, that this also happened in China, right? So you have, um, when I, I studied under Professor David Keatley at UC Berkeley, when I was doing my history degree there, and he's an expert in ancient China. <clears throat> and uh, and I asked him, like, said, well, like, so I, I want to tell you what I'm most interested in. Were there any atheist philosophers in ancient China? And he says, oh, yeah, you, you've got to read Wang Chung, who's like one of the, the top Confucian scholars of the, of the Han Dynasty, wrote a whole two-volume treatise on this subject. I'm like, oh, damn, I got to go read that. Uh, and it's really hard to find these in English translation. Like, there, a lot of them are out of print. Uh, I actually found uh, an old uh, used copy in a, in a university uh, bookstore, um, used bookstore near, near the campus. Uh, and so I have my, my Lun Hang, my uh, translation of Wang Chung's two-volume work. Uh, and that's what he does. He, do, he goes through the whole thing doing kind of like a David Hume thing on Confucianism, where he's just saying, well, new supernatural things don't really exist. It's really just nature. It's really just chance and probability. It's really these things. And it's like, he's a total naturalist. He's right in, not full-on atomist like, like the Epicureans, but he's in that trend. And so you have those two trends in China as well, right? So then you get, you know, goes all the way up to to Mao and the communist, uh, the communist revolution, where you had these two camps competing against each other, <clears throat> and leading to different catastrophic results out there. But uh, but they had the same twin pattern of of how to explain the world that, that the West did. 
so it seems to be that this is, uh, these are the two modes that we can actually go into uh, explaining the universe with. And, and humans have a tendency to switch, to go towards the supernatural mode, but a few humans everywhere in every culture start to realize that maybe that's not sound. Yeah. And what do you think the, the outcomes of each of those has brought to the world? Uh, well, obviously, as most people know, I'm <clears throat> uh, debunker of Christian apologetics and Islamic apologetics. Uh, I think supernaturalism has been bad, right? It's, it's been it's been hijacked by people who want to control populations um, and build them for money, uh, but also just for political and social power, which wasn't the case originally, the way religions worked. Uh, and that that's not turned out well. And it also makes people bad thinkers. But it's it's not that supernatural. Getting rid of supernaturalism is not enough because we have uh, secular naturalistic conspiracy theories and and false yeah. ideologies and beliefs too. So people have a tendency, to, even if once they sort of get rid of the supernaturalism, they still have this tendency to get trapped in delusions and false ideologies. And this is an inherent problem with the human brain that we've evolved to have we're evolved to be poor reasoners. So we have to actually train ourselves culturally and, and through through education to be better reasoners, to be critical about our own intuitions. And that I think is is the, the path that would help the world in, in every way, both the secular side and and the supernatural side. So do you think there's a particular method of philosophy that is the clear cut, useful? philosophy? Yeah, I, have, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about the methodology and philosophy. Um, I mean, obviously, a very careful adherence to logic uh, is important, obviously. But that's not enough, because you need premises to put into your logic. Uh, and so I think philosophy needs to be evidence based. And I think it need, it can't be armchair. It, it has to you have to get out into the world and go look at things. You have to go across the hall and talk to the scientist who's an expert in the thing you're talking about. Philosophy needs to be very, very much building on where we've gotten to with science. So they need to be well informed in the science of whatever they're talking about and build on top of that. And what they build should be should be consistent with it. Uh, and so if you, I think if you did both things, if you do fallacy attendance, like purging fallacies, logical fallacies, and empirical real world science-based reasoning, that's where true philosophy lies, is the combining of those two methodologies. But you see, even in contemporary philosophy today, a lot of failure to really carefully adhere to both of those. Uh, sometimes sometimes both at the same time, but sometimes one or the other. You get a lot of philosophy that's very armchair, not attending to the science. Uh, and you get a, a lot of philosophy, a lot of fallacies, even in peer-reviewed journal articles. Uh, they're, they're not policing it well enough. And so I think that's those are the two things that I think we really need to nose down on and make sure philosophers stick to those principles. That's a good point. So let's go to some super chats. Marcos Gonzalez, thank you for the four ninety nine. He says, hello, Dr. Carrier. I've asked you many questions before, <laughs> but this time <laughs> he's just laying it right out there. He's following you around. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this time the people and I would like to know, why are you so awesome? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, uh, the joke question will get a joke answer. Um, yeah. Oban, 12. Nice, nice. 12-year 12, 12 single malt. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, I put it to you that it's that. I, either that or I'll give you the homework assignment. Uh, whoever wants to know the answer to that question should write a 2,000-word essay answering the question with bibliography and footnotes. <laughs> nice. Uh, John Jingle, 499. He says, what does Carrier think of Jesus being from Nazareth and why? Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> not a philosophy question, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it does tie into, uh, so I've, one of the peer reviewed works that I've published is Proving History. Uh, I actually had that uh, peer reviewed by a professor of mathematics and a professor of biblical studies, uh, manda mandatory in my contract. I wouldn't let Prometheus publish it if it wasn't peer reviewed. Uh, and that's a contribution in philosophy of history. Well, what is the philosophy of history? What is the epistemology? underlying history and ontology. And I talk about the ontology of history as well in that book, but it's mostly epistemology. And so the questions, you know, how, how do you analyze questions like this? Um, so what, what does it mean to say Jesus from Nazareth? Uh, now, it, semantically, plain language, uh, what we're talking about is that a lot of believers and secularists claim that there was a historical Jesus, even if he's heavily mythologized in the gospels, that there was some sort of guy, he's just an ordinary dude, 
maybe a guru type, maybe a David Koresh type, who knows? There's a lot of different models, a lot of different possibilities, all plausible. Um, but the question is, uh, did he actually hail from the small town of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth actually wasn't that small a town, as people claim. Uh, it was actually one of the towns that took in priests after the destruction of the temple. Uh, and priests would not go habitate in some hodunk nowhere. So, so Nazareth had to be something significant at the time. And this is 70 AD, which would only been like, you know, uh, one generation later than Jesus would have been uh, uh, preaching, right? Uh, so, yeah, so, so Nazareth wasn't really that tiny a town anyway. Um, but uh, the question is, did he really come from there? Uh, and I think as a historian, you have to look at the evidence and not just assume that the stories being told to you are true, um, but question them. I approach the text critically. And when we look at Matthew, Matthew says that this idea of him coming from Nazareth was a lift from scripture. He says this comes, this fulfills the scripture, yada, yada. He doesn't say what scripture, but he genuinely believed there was a scripture that this fulfilled. And there's been much discussion of which scripture it could have been. Uh, one of the things we need to know is we do not have the exact scriptures that they did. Uh, their scriptures said slightly different things than ours, had, slightly, had different things in it and so on. Uh, they counted different books of scripture than we do. So um, so we might not be able to answer that question, but it seems clear that they thought that this was something that they lifted out of scripture, just like Bethlehem. So the idea of Jesus being born in Bethlehem was also lifted out of scripture. So I think what you have is two different traditions lifting, uh, tr basically assigning him to a town and you get these two contradictory traditions that people later harmonize. Uh, and I think both of them are equally bogus. I think they're both come from scripture. But the question is, uh, the, the way it gets framed, like in the, the logic of it, um, uh, Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens is famous for the argument, is he says like, well, why would they assign this to him? It's a ho-dunk town. The, own, the best explanation is that he actually came from there and they were just trumping it up. And that's an argument that sh that's claiming that this piece of evidence, the him being assigned to the town of Nazareth, is more likely if he really came from there than if he didn't, right? This is the claim, which is logically valid, right? That is an actually valid way to argue. But with all logical arguments, you have to check the premises. Uh, and so the question is, what if you put in a hypothesis here that they, they had the same reason to assign him to Nazareth as they did to Bethlehem. Well, now this equation falls apart. So now it's equally likely that he came from Nazareth or that he was assigned to Nazareth because it fulfilled scripture. And so the argument that it makes more sense or that it's more logical that he came from there falls apart when you actually dig down and look at the bedrock of the context in which this was actually promulgated. And of course, we don't see this reference in Paul. Paul never says he came from Nazareth. So. Good point. Right. All, all we have is, is from the Gospels, which we know are heavily mythologizing uh, and, and did do these kinds of things, like assign towns based on their mythological or scriptural relevance. And this wouldn't be the first time they quoted scripture that they lost, because in other parts of the New Testament, they're quoting scripture that's gone. Like Enoch, for example, that's getting quoted by Jude. And that scripture was gone up until they found another Enoch later on. So Right, and we don't we don't actually have the Enoch that they were reading. We we have a version of it uh, and it's in a different language even. It's been translated and and so on. So um so it's it's hard for us to get back at the scriptures that they're talking about. But we also know that that we have debates we see them in the church fathers already. They're debating the existence of passages that read differently than ours do. And we found more at at Qumran. We found versions of Isaiah that say different things than our Isaiah says, right? So, so, so they were aware that there were many different versions of these scriptures that said different things. And we only have fragments of stuff from yeah. Qumran. We don't have like a complete library. We don't have the whole Old Testament, right? Much less multiple versions of it, right? So, uh, so, so we have enough evidence to know that the scriptures used to say all kinds of things that they don't say now. And so we can't say that this Nazareth prediction wasn't in there. It might've been in there. Now, of course, Matthew doesn't say it's Nazareth specifically. He says Nazorian, which Jesus, he will be called a Nazorian. That was the scripture. Uh, and all the attributions of Jesus to Nazareth, all, they call him Nazorian, which is not a person from Nazareth. It means something else, right? Uh, it's, it's Mark who actually seems to have transformed this. We looked for the nearest sounding town and picked Nazareth and then put that in there. And if it wasn't Mark who did it, uh, it seems quite clear that Matthew had done so. Um. I got two things I want to say about this. Number one, have you ever heard people say that this is other mythicists that say this, that it's possible that this could be a trans mistranslation from Nazarite, which is the vow 
from the Old Testament. Right. I, I wouldn't say mistranslation. I would say a deliberate, a deliberate illusion, right? So, um, because that's the same with Nazorian, right? It's the same kind of thing that that's not someone from Nazareth. So why was why did Mark think Nazareth? Um, because it was the closest, it was the town that sounded the most similar, right? And it could be the same thing for Nazarite. Like, oh, the scriptures predicted he would be a Nazarite, um, but they didn't want to make him a Nazarite uh, explicitly because that's a very specific kind of thing. Uh, and so they said, well, maybe that meant Nazareth, and someone from Nazareth, right? That's the kind of thinking that they would engage in. Uh, so it is possible to have come about that way. That is actually a legitimate theory that's in this peer-reviewed literature. Um, it's not out there, but we can't prove it, right? Yeah. And the other thing I want to say before I move on to the next one is, can you imagine what that would do if, like, they dug up some 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 archaeology spot somewhere and they found this ancient Aramaic scroll that's, like, the man from Nazareth who's going to be the Messiah, and it dates to, like, 100 B.C.? <laughs> that would be crazy. There are a lot of things that'd be crazy, uh, but um, <clears throat> I can speculate all day long. But <laughs> yeah, no, no. it certainly would vindicate you, though, if that, if that ever did happen. But you know, you never know. Um, next one is Jason Anderson, one forty nine super sticker. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. And moving along, we have Constellation Pegasus, four ninety nine. Thank you. Quick question: Did the Jews general population used to say God's word out loud? Sorry to change the topic here. I think he means the name of God. Do you mean the name of God or do you mean scripture? Hey, God's word out loud. Oh, yeah. God's word out loud. It could be either thing. Um, the answer is, if, it, if you mean scripture, uh, yes, it would be read out loud. Uh, in fact, most people, their only exposure to scripture was orally. They, most people were not literate. Uh, so you had to read it out loud for any anyone who wasn't literate to even know what it said. Uh, but if you mean the name of God, that's a different thing, right? So the name of God was actually... It was technically forbidden to say. It wasn't like you had a blanket prohibition, um, but it was the idea that you can't take the names, the Lord's name in vain. Now, the words in vain basically were very broadly interpreted. So, like, you just couldn't casually just say God's name. And then you would generally avoid saying it for fear that it would, it would be in vain, right? So, uh, whether it was or not. And so that was called the Tetragrammaton, which is Yahweh, which is the actual name of God. And so uh, an, an epithet would be substituted. So, the Lord, that's how we get the Lord. Um, Adonai and things like that. It's a substitution that stands in for what was really in the text. And we can see the scriptures chained over time. Um, older version manuscripts have more Yahweh's in them and they start to become Adonai's and Lord's and things like that. So they actually get changed to be more sanitized in effect. And, and of course, modern Bibles today, if it's a Jewish Bible, it will, it will be, it'll be something like G dash D. Like it won't even like it won't even say God, right? Not even the generic word God will be in there. They'll, they'll basically blank it out in the same way you would the F word or something. But um, weird. So yeah, in antiquity, that was also a thing. Like, so you wouldn't say the name of God specifically, but you could refer to God with epithets and out loud. And that wasn't a problem. Yeah. I think now they say Hashem, the name. Um, a lot of Jews do. Right. That, that will also, that's one way to get around that. Yeah. 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 Um, the next one. And by the way, thank you for that super chat. The next one, Gaius Julius Windex. This guy is always watching my show. Thank you. <laughs> Thoughts on the Tao Te Ching? Useful. Tao Te Ching. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, useful. I, you know, like like most scriptures of most religions, it has its uses, but it, it depends on how you approach the text, right? If you approach it as a collection of human philosophy and not like sacred not like it, you you don't assume that everything it says is correct right uh all its intuitions might sound profound or great but if you think about them actually they, they don't hold up right so it's so if you approach it critically uh i think there's a lot of value in the Tao Te Ching. i would say there's more of value in the Tao Te Ching than there is in the old testament honestly right uh you know i, I could put probably all the verses that are actually worthwhile all the concepts let's say all the concepts that are worthwhile in the bible on a single sheet of paper easily uh <clears throat> they might be repeated many many times the same thing over and over again but when you get to just the concepts it's not a long list uh and you, if you look at the bible it's a really it's a lot of words in there uh it's very inefficient the Tao Te Ching is way more efficient than that so there's really not a word wasted uh and i would say that it's about 80 percent valuable and the 20 percent that's wrong 
I think you could figure it out uh, in, in what ways it's wrong and stuff. But it can be a big challenge for a modern philosopher, a modern or person who's aware and mostly knows modern philosophy because contemporary philosophy is mostly in the analytic tradition. And people who don't know the difference, there's analytic and continental. Continental tradition philosophy is mostly just editorials. It's like people just talking right it's like oh here are my thoughts on things and you just ramble on about your thoughts uh you know so you get like Camus and Diderot and the, the you know th there's uh, uh Nietzsche is an example of this um <clears throat> Hume is an example of this although he's proto-analytical but he's still it's even conscious like this like they just tell you their ideas basically and just and talk and talk and talk analytical is about let's break this down atomize it to its basic sentences uh, his basic concepts. Let's use formal logic. Let's use uh, structures. Let's <clears throat> let's analyze what all these words mean that we're using, and uh, be as efficient as possible with the words we're using in terms of describing the specific things we're talking about. Um, whereas continental philosophy can get very um, uh, artistic in the way that it uses the impacts of words. It plays upon the wide valences of words much more freely, which would be considered an equivocation fallacy in the analytical tradition. So. You gotta be aware of this. So, so the Tao Te Ching is very much like a continental style philosophy, where it's they're using single words to represent huge valences of concepts at the same time, uh, and so it's not analytical. To turn an analytical eye to the Tao Te Ching would be a lot of work. It's valuable. It's worth doing, and I've done it. Um, but uh, uh, it, there's easier ways to go about. Uh, learning that stuff you don't need the Tao Te Ching for it <laughs> yeah uh th there's been a lot of writing about what is the difference between eastern and western philosophy um like just generically and and if you get the gist of those differences then you'll have the gist of what you could have gotten from the Tao Te Ching by studying it specifically it seems to be I'm, I'm not like expert on this but I've read it I've read through it it seems to be very dualistic if that makes no sense. It, it really isn't okay. um I mean, and, and I know how you, I know why you say that. I mean, you look like the yin yang, right? Isn't that dualistic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, the Tao Te Ching is monistic, right? Because the whole point of the Tao Te Ching is you can't have one without the other, uh, and that they you need both to interact with each other. Uh, and so it's more, it's it's not so much that there is a good and evil. That is actually not even Chinese, much less Taoist. Uh, that that's more of a Western concept. I their, their dualism, their dualism was different. Like, where there was a there was a value in a place for both sides of everything. And the ideal state was the correct balance between them. Uh, and this gets closer to what Aristotle was talking about with the golden mean, the idea that the, every virtue has its vice and every virtue taken to extreme becomes a vice so that you can be like so compassionate that you are a gullible fool that everybody takes advantage of. Yes. Um, or you can be a total miser. Um, the best place to be is in the middle. It'd be someone who's a balanced amount of compassion and uh, self-interest, right? That's that would be the, the Aristotelian way. That's that's really analytical. So that's definitely an Aristotle is almost the king of the analytical tradition. Um, whereas the Tao Te Ching would say kind of say kind of the same thing, but they would go about it differently. They would think of it more holistically in terms of your place in a social system rather than your own individual decision making. Um, it's like how do you fit in here? Are you contributing or are you harming? Are you are, are you participating in the flow of the river of life or are you impeding it, right? Like it would be those kinds of much more abstract concepts of how you place yourself in the world. Um, and I think both are true. They're both getting at the same concept. But uh, one of the things that you, if you looked at one of those um, comparisons between Eastern and Western philosophy, one of the things that Eastern philosophy focuses on a lot to the detriment of the particular is the general, looking at holistic big picture stuff. How does everything work together? That's valuable, but they do it too much. Whereas in the West, they focus on particularization, individual particular things, individual rights, for example, also valuable, but you can focus on it too much and miss the big picture and, and miss the role of your position in the, the, not just the social system, but the environment and the physical system and so on. So I think that once again, very Aristotelian and also very Taoist, the best position is to be a merger between them. But where is the balance between paying attention to the holistic big picture and paying attention to the particular and individual, we need both and we need the right balance of both. And that really, I think if, if you were to talk to a Taoist philosopher about this and talk, show him like Hume and Aristotle and stuff like that and have this conversation, he'd probably say, yeah, you know what? I think you're right about that. Yeah. And it's not a theistic philosophy at all. It's it is not. It, it, 
Well, it, it's in the middle, right? So it, it has it has That's something true. in the place of a god. So it's it's more like the Force, right? So it's more like the Jedi religion, the, the, which yeah. really exists, right? There's people who actually practice the Jedi religion uh, today. Um, it's more like that, right? It's more like the Force, and the Force is not more like a vegetable mind. It's not an intellect. It's not a person who thinks and has particular intentions and stuff. It is more like a force of consciousness that just does what it does, but it has inclinations. <clears throat> and so it is a supernatural entity of some form. Uh, so the Tao is like that. Um, but the Tao is not, uh, you know, it's like the, one of the things that the Tao De Jing says is that, you know, when you, when you particularize and break things down, you make them more imperfect. So if you were to, in the Taoist idea, uh, God, the Christian God would be actually wildly imperfect because he's right. too focused on particular things. Uh, he's too, too, too specific. He's too broken up into all these ideas. Whereas the, the Tao is actually just goes with the flow, right? It just is, it, it doesn't, it doesn't think particular thoughts. It doesn't separate particular things. Uh, and, and so that, that's what makes, uh, the, the Tao, the Tao, right? And so there's a conflict in their theologies. Uh, and so I would say Taoism, Taoism is supernaturalist, but atheistic, um, un unless you were really broad in how you define what a God is. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, there's like there's a, a passage in there where it says something along the lines of like give away religion and you will have pi piety or something along the yes, lines. Yes, uh, yeah, and that's it's important to understand the context. So this this actually is a good connection between philosophy and history. Understanding ancient philosophy of any kind, whether it's Aristotle or Dao, the Tao Te Ching, requires understanding its context, right? Because they're, they're talking about a context that they're living in, which is not. The context we're living in and that that passage that you're talking about is a dig on confucians right so so taoism was a response to confucianism uh and very much in the same way that aristotle was a response to plato right uh, or even you could say epicureanism was a real harsh response to plato but but aristotle still like is against plato uh and and there and a lot of what aristotle says you have to understand He's saying it because he's trying to contradict and disprove Plato. And once you understand that, then you'll understand what Aristotle's getting back, getting at more often. Tao Te Ching, same way. A lot of what's in the Tao Te Ching is anti-Confucian. And it's not so much that they hated Confucians. It's just they disagreed with them. Uh, and so they had different ideas about this stuff. So that's one of the Confucians were very big on organized religion, uh, socially backed religion, big religion, institutional religion, and also personal religion. But, but, shrines rituals uh you know everything that's a costume like everything that that makes religion a, f a physically manifest thing in society was important to the confucians not because it was important to honor god or whatever uh but because it was important for social order that religion ordered the mind and ordered society that was that was their view and they would always brush off questions of whether the gods existed by saying it doesn't matter right? It doesn't matter whether God exists. You should have a well-ordered society. God wants that. You want that. So who cares whether gods exist or not? It's not relevant to the problem. Um, whereas the Taoists are very much like, they're so focused on the particulars of costume, of ritual, of trying to get people to conform to specific traditions, that this actually, you get distracted with this and your faith becomes all about following a tradition rather than an actual faith right and this is a conversation that christians have today with each other like they argue with each other about getting so obsessed with your rituals that you stop really paying attention to what it means to be a christian uh and that's what the Taoists are saying about the confucians in this passage is like if you want to know how to be a, a, a pious person with respect to the gods the spirits the world your ancestors it's, you, you need to get away from obsessing over the particulars of, of rituals and find the way, basically just, just find a way to just flow through it uh, without the particulars. So there are generalists rather than particularists, uh, whereas the Confucians are particularists. Um, so that's the conversation going on there. And so you, you understand those things. This is another problem with if you just approach the Tao Te Ching, it might speak to you today, but that might be saying different things than they originally meant when they wrote. Now, whether you consider that worthwhile or not is up to you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to understand what they really meant when they said it at the time, then you've got to understand their context, which means you have to study Confucianism, not just Taoism, uh, for example, but as well as Chinese uh, education, Chinese society, uh, Chinese politics, because that's a big deal. There's a lot of stuff in the Tao Te Ching that reflects on the, the recent uh, debates over whether war is a good thing or a bad thing uh, and, and so on. So uh, because of recent empire building, 
uh, that was going on at the time. So it's a lot of stuff that makes more sense in context. Uh, if you take it out of context, then it becomes like poetry. It can, spe it can speak your, its own truth to you. It's not what the author intended, but you still get something out of it. Uh, right. That's valid. That's valid too, but you have to re understand and admit that that's what you're doing uh, when you approach the text, which is what Christians do with the Bible, right? Uh, but they just won't admit that that's what they're doing with the Bible, uh, is getting their own truths out of it and ignoring what the original authors intended. Yep, that's why you have all these sects and denominations. Right. Constellation Pegasus came back for some more, and he says, any book references on why the human brain needed gods and why it's hard to break away from them, from critical thinking skills and researching? Yeah, that's a really good question. And yes, there's a really good book, Daniel Dennett's Breaking the Spell. Um, and the reason I recommend that one is because what Dennett does in that, he's not doing anything new. He's synthesizing a broad field of science. Uh, there's been a lot of science in sociology. There's a sociology of religion. There's psychology of religion and there's anthropology of religion and cognitive science of religion. And there's tons of books and papers and research on all of these fields with lots, we, we know a lot of things about this stuff. Dennett goes and finds all the best, juiciest, most important stuff and condenses it into a text for the every everyday reader. And just basically, here's the science of religion, what we know about religion, including the cognitive science of religion. And he summarizes, he does exactly what, what this person's asking about here. Uh, so Breaking the Spell is a good book. And it cites other books if you want to dive further in. Um, you know, Atron's book, uh, Atron has done this. Guthrie has done they're, done important stuff in this. Faces in the Clouds is an example. Guthrie's book on that. Um, has, it goes into the cognitive science and the uh, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology of religion. Uh, so there's, there, there, yes, there's a lot out there that's it's interesting. But the place to start, I would say, is Breaking the Spell. There you go. That's a great answer. Festering boils. Thank you for the 499. In Matthew 28, 2, when the stone is rolled away, does the Greek language allow for a flashback? <laughs> okay, there's a lot of backstory on that question. Um, you can go into philosophy of language on this one, right? Uh, yeah. So, okay, I, 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 I understand correctly. And here I am engaging in metacognition. I'm trying to uh, figure out what it is they actually mean, uh, the questioner. And here I think they're talking about, uh, so the um, the stone gets rolled away and then, um, <laughs> and then the tomb is already empty, uh, for one thing. So you're wondering like, well, well, how did Jesus get out? Uh, and, and then the other question is, did the women see this? Uh, right. So there's, there's the, they have the women show up and those guards at the tomb or whatever. And then, uh, this angel, um, moves the stone. I can't remember the exact chronology, whether the women get there after the stone gets moved or, or whatever, but the angel does talk to the women. Uh, yeah. so, so, right. So there's the question of the chronology of what's going on. What is, what is, Matthew imagine is happening here. Uh, and I mean, it's fiction. So you're really trying to get into the mind of a fiction author of what, what scene he's trying to picture happening. None of this really happened. Um, so uh, flashback, I don't think so. I don't think the Greek f flashbacks aren't really a thing that uh, you don't find that in ancient literature very much at all. If there's a flashback, it's very explicit. Let me tell you a story about something that happened in the past. It's a digression, not a flashback. Uh, so flashbacks aren't really an instrument, uh, even in so far there's anything like a flashback, it's explicit. It's not implicit. So, so the, and, and obviously there's no explicit flashback in Matthew. So, uh, so definitely not, uh, well, I, yeah, definitely I definitely not something we can conclude is going on there. Yeah. I know Josephus likes to bounce around in his narrative. Yeah. He'll, he'll say, and here, this leads me to talk about this other thing. And then he like, it's an obvious digression where he's talking about the past of a thing. Yeah. Xenophon is a good example. Xenophon has a lot of these digressions. He's telling this story because he, he was a, he was a soldier, an officer in the, in the 10,000 that actually yeah. fought their way out of Persia. And he wrote the, wrote the book about it this eyewitness a book about it, but it's filled with myths funny. and tales. Yeah. Um, right. The Anabasis, Actually, which is uh, called the what they say um, uh, what the the, tr the trek up country. There's different ways to translate it. Um, oh yeah, yeah. But um, <clears throat> but yeah, and he fills it with these backstories of like, let me tell you the backstory on this, and then he'll tell you a story, a historical event or something in the past. But it's explicit, right? He's telling you that he's doing this, uh, right. and so um, the idea of just suddenly switching into flashback with some sort of grammatical trick. Um, you might find that in modern fiction, but it, it's not a device that existed in ancient fiction. Good point. Good point. And I hope that answers your question. Constellation Pegasus again, 499. Thank you. The last question. Okay. We'll see. Let's see, let's see if you stick to your word. Last question for both of you. What was it that broke your back to make you leave religion? 
broke my back. I don't even know what that means. Um, so uh, leave religion for me means leave Taoism. Uh, I don't think people realize that I, I was never a Christian. Uh, I was nominally Methodist when I was a kid only because my family was, but it was super liberal Methodism and my family never expected me to be a believer and I never was. Like I was never baptized. I never declared a faith uh, in Christianity in any form. Um, Christianity was just the religion of my neighborhood basically. But the first real religion I had, like that I had faith in, that I believed was Taoism. Uh, and and I have a whole story of how that happened to me as a teenager. I was a Taoist for many years. I was a Taoist when I went to boot camp. Uh, I was just advising uh, an ex-girlfriend of mine. She's going into boot camp and she was asking for advice on what to bring as reading material as an atheist. Uh, and and she, so she knows my backstory too about how I actually transcribed my own Tao Te Ching, taking translation, my favorite translation of every stanza from six different printed translations. And I made my own Bible because wow. you're allowed one devotional reading in boot camp you could take with you that you can read. And so I made my own Tao De, handwritten at Tao Te Ching was my devotional item. And I was declared Taoist officially in the in the military records as for my religion. So um, I, I, was, I left Taoism in the Coast Guard. Uh, so it was really near the end of my tour at sea. Uh, I started to have doubts about Taoism. Uh, and then started looking for like, well, what is true? Uh, and then it was, I think it was, I can't remember the exact chronology. It was my last year. So it was my year at sea. And uh, so I started having doubts about Taoism. Um, and then I, I remember I was on a base. I was down in San Diego. I was there for a torpedo fuel fire training. And, and a Navy, you know, sailor comes up to me and does the whole evangelism things like, have you found Jesus? And, uh, and, you know, at, at that time I was still nominally Taoist. So I said, well, I'm really a Taoist and there's a reason why I don't need to follow anything other than the Tao. Cause even your God has to follow the Tao. And so I'm covered. Um, and so, you know, they didn't have a script for that. So they switched scripts to their usual, like, well, have you read the Bible? And I said, you know, I read some of it when I was a kid, but not really. And, uh, and he says, well, how can you judge a thing if you haven't read it? And I was like, Fair point. And he says, if I give you this student Bible, will you promise to read it? And I said, I absolutely will. I'll totally read it. Uh, and so I took that Bible and I read it cover to cover, uh, Old Testament and New. Uh, and when I completed it, I remember I was in the barracks alone. I read it. I said out loud, yep, I'm an atheist. Because <laughs> if Taoism wasn't true and this stuff definitely wasn't true, uh, I knew that it was clearly there was no true religion. Like this is just pe hogwash that people were convincing themselves of. And then, you know, I was, I was out on the town and uh, at the Castro street fair in San Francisco, which you can't get more liberal and, uh, you know, more of a place to freak out a Christian, but I was there with my Christian buddy. Uh, I had a friend who was Christian and, but he knew I was an atheist and there was a booth there that was for American atheists. And it said American atheists on it. And he says, Hey, those are your people. And I was like, those are my people. <laughs> I go over there and I, you know, buy some books and talk to them and stuff. And so that's how I actually got into atheism. It was actually, uh, it was a philosophical journey for me. It wasn't a journey of reacting against, like feeling like I'd been lied to by a religion all my life. I really only got exposed to the awfulness of Christianity after I became an atheist. Because uh, then it was really, before that I did a little bit, like as soon as I graduated high school, I was still a Taoist. Uh, when I started becoming a voting citizen, that's when I started noticing that Christian, the Christian right were a real problem, uh, like an actual problem for humanity. And, and that mist mystified me. I didn't really understand it. Uh, but I didn't really get into like debunking Christianity until I was an atheist. And that, that's when I realized like, this is a problem. Now that I'm an atheist, uh, these arguments infuriate me. So I really have to like deconstruct this stuff and get involved. And so that's how I got involved in the atheism movement. But I, I don't have this, I was a fundamentalist and felt lied to and, and you know, so there's no, there's no breaking of my back. It was just yeah. the realization of, of that this is, wait a minute, what I believe it actually has other explanations, better explanations. Uh, and I also started to notice contradictions or things that I didn't believe were true in the Taoist scriptures. So when I started to doubt the, the sacred inviolability of the Taoist scriptures, like, like I thought like the author of it had been, communicated to by the Tao and couldn't possibly write anything that was wrong. When I realized that, no, it's just some dude who has ideas. Uh, and, and then, you know, then I had, I was studying science and realized that my religious experiences had scientific explanations. Um, that's when I started realizing, well, that, if that's not true, then what is? And that led me on a, on a quest for worldview theory, which I was in, and it led through atheism, but it wasn't just atheism. It was, it was like we talked about before naturalism. It was this idea of, how do you explain the whole world? What, what are my positive beliefs? 
without gods, without the supernatural. And that's what led to my book, Sense and Goodness Without God, which is like 80%, 90% of it is about what I do believe and what I think atheists should believe are positive beliefs, not just what we shouldn't believe in. It has a section on that, but it's mostly about what do we replace religion with? Uh, and it's a philosophical worldview, uh, naturalism, something like what Aristotle was doing. Um, obviously, Aristotle was wrong about a bunch of stuff, so we don't right. just copy what he's doing. Uh, but he had the right idea. Like what he's doing is the kind of thing we need to be doing as philosophers, building coherent worldviews that are very science and evidence based. Wow, that's interesting. And now when you, when you started getting your PhD in, in history, was this after this? Yes. Uh, yeah. After I left the military, uh, I immediately went to college um, and, and sampled a bunch of majors. It's a whole other long story of how I got into history. I would never have thought that that would happen, but it did. Uh, and so then I ended up doing history. And I, I also have been doing philosophy, right? So I've been, I've actually been a peer reviewed published philosopher for longer than I have a historian because my first peer reviewed article was uh, for critical thinking on uh, analyzing uh, Buddhist meditation uh, from a philosophical perspective. And I've been doing things like this. So I have, I have a whole CV full of peer reviewed philosophy work that's in contemporary philosophy, not just history of philosophy. And so my history is mostly in history of philosophy so that there's an overlap there. Um, so, uh, so religion, ancient philosophy, even ancient history, I approached as a philosophical tradition and science. Uh, so all of those things I studied in antiquity from the philosophical perspective. So my training in philosophy, insofar as it comes from the academy, was it was through the history of philosophy. But then the rest is just doing the work, um, you know. So uh, actually reading philosophers, actually reading widely, reading the relevant science, studying logic, uh, learning how to make a rational argument, how to avoid fallacies, and all of that stuff. That stuff I did I on my own, basically as my religion. Uh, for since I left the Coast Guard in 92, all the way up to when I published Sense and Goodness in 2005. So that was really my my private, personal, religious life was philosophy. Uh, and then just my profession uh, happened to be historian. Interesting. Um, I'm going to keep going. I know it says a question for both of us, but you guys got my channel. You guys know why I left religion. It's all there. If you really, if, I, if we have time at the end, if I get to right. these questions, I'll get to it. Well, I'm going to keep going. Uh, so imposter Sir Spence, do you think the founding fathers were deists? Most of them, yeah. Um, the word founding fathers is very broad, sure. So it depends on who you mean. Um, some of them, well, I mean, they all had denominations, so they were all Christians. There is, I mean, it depends on how broad you're going. So, like Thomas Paine, for example, do you count him as a founding father? Um, it, but he's definitely a deist, like, he wrote some of the most definitive works on the time. Um, and wasn't then, uh, he a wasn't he a mythicist too? Uh, uh, yeah, kind of right. Um, yeah, he was, he was willing to doubt it. Uh, really to doubt Jesus was a real person. Uh, he, he definitely was of the camp that the Bible was all made up. Uh, that, that is for sure. Um, but there were, there were some, uh, people. So I, I, uh, wrote an article a while ago about the founding fathers and their religious views and, and what they thought about the constitution and the Bible or the 10 commandments even. And John Adams wrote a book about the history of democracy that, of course, was meant to explain the rise of their democracy, American democracy. And he, he has a lot of things he says in it, but he, he talks about how American democracy was fought for by so many diverse people of religious, different religious persuasions, including atheists. So he actually includes atheists within the moral community of people fighting for freedom. And so he knew atheists were a thing. And we have, there's some, there's some like really minor uh, uh, founding fathers who may have been actual atheists. It's hard to be an atheist at that time right. uh, because that would be, the stigma would be tremendous. It was safer to position yourself as a deist, even if you really weren't. Uh, and so a lot of the deists might not have actually been deists. They might've actually been atheists, but they were being atheists in the safest way possible, which is to be a deist. <laughs> <laughs> at so, the time, but even they would have denominations. They would be congregationalist. Uh, they would have a church. They would have a pastor or the equivalent. Um, they would go to they would go to Sunday school or, or uh, Sunday mass or the equivalent in, in whatever tradition that they're doing. Um, wasn't Catholic, of course, but uh, but there were a lot of like actual denominations that were very open minded as to uh, like how far you could deviate from their theology and still be accepted in church. 
Uh, but they still do that. So that was that was a thing back then. Are you ready for these Thomas Paine quotes that I just pulled up real quick? Sure, yeah. <laughs> the Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun in which they put a man named Christ in the place of the sun and pay him adoration. And before you say anything about that one, this one I think is even worse. It is the fable of Jesus Christ as told in the New Testament and the wild and visionary doctrine raised therein against which I contend. The story taking it as told, blasphemy obscene. Yeah. <laughs> And he, he doesn't just say that. He he goes on to explain why he thinks that. And it is hard to argue with him uh, in some of the, some respects. But um, yeah, prim, primitive early mythicism there. I mean, he's definitely an amateur writer at the point as a historian. He doesn't yeah. know all the ins and outs. But, uh, but he has some, um, there's a lot of apt criticism of the incoherence of the Bible and its obvious mythic aspects. So definitely some of the earliest writing on that nature. Much of which he wrote actually from prison in France, which is a whole other story yeah uh the next one joshua owens thank you for the ten dollars thank you really appreciate that dr carrier are you interested in speaking to unitarian congregation at some point in the near future yeah i've done that several times actually i've spoken to many uh, uh unitarian congregations all over the country actually um would love to yeah any anytime have them get in touch with me i have a booking page if you want to know what it takes to get me yeah. Uh, in to speak. So, um, yeah, happy to, uh, always love Unitarian congregations, especially if they, if they have grounds, I love uh, visiting Unitarian churches and their grounds are always uh, a pleasure. And there's links in the description on how to get to you and donate money to you and all that stuff. Um, Derek myth vision podcast. What's up, buddy? He says, <laughs> how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck? I bet you're not able to answer this. Therefore, God exists. Uh... <laughs> I assume that's Derek. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty funny. Derek's, if, if, if you haven't subscribed to him already, I'm sure most of you have. But Yeah, I always recommend his show. It's, it's, it's good. There's a lot of really interesting stuff because he interviews a lot of interesting people in biblical studies, like actual professors who've written important books and stuff that people yeah. would never have heard of otherwise, uh, women and men. Uh, so people of all denominations and positions, uh, uh you'll learn a lot uh, from his channel. He's a good interviewer too. Yeah. He's the most unbiased interviewer. He, whoever he's interviewing, he's on that level with that person. He's not trying to, you know, destroy people or attack people. He's trying to let the people talk, get their points across, you know, and he's not just in he's any challenge. He'll, he'll give, he'll give some pushback, right? He'll yeah. give some challenge, but he'll he'll be he'll be polite about it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So he's yeah. the perfect, perfect amount of pushback. Doc Pleroma Nut, ten dollars. I appreciate that. He says, ever since Bardet or Venturini, Jesus' relationship with the to the Essenes has been a prominent feature in Western esotericism. Do you think this created an anxiety of influence among Christian scholars? I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> um, so, so this is a thing that happened in the middle of the 20th century um, where there was this growing idea that Christianity might have just been an Essene sect, uh, that Jesus himself might have been an Essene. And there's an argument, there's a case to be made because uh, uh, there are a lot of similarities and parallels. Um, I, I think the sect that Christianity came out of, the sect that, Jesus would have belonged to if he existed or the sect that Peter would have belonged to originally if Jesus didn't exist. I do think it either, if it wasn't an Essene sect, it was definitely an Essene influenced sect like we see at Qumran. So Qumran sect has a lot of similarities to Essenism. We don't know if it is an Essene sect. They never call themselves that. Right. Um, <clears throat> but it definitely is in the Essene tradition. And I think Christianity is an offshoot or, or cousin of that. And the interesting thing is that Essenes, we, we have some texts that say that the Essene tradition actually grew out of the Samaritan tradition. So there's actually, you can link it back to Samaritanism, um, which creates a whole other area of interesting complexity because the Jews at the time were very big, or the Judeans were very big on condemning Samaritans as being basically apostatizers, not real Jews. Um, and, and, but that's, that's prejudice. It was largely bogus. Like they, they actually are Jewish. They were just a radically different sect of Judaism. Yeah. Uh, and they were a sect of Judaism that didn't, that never left Judea. They were, they did not undergo the exile. They actually integrated uh, locally um, with, with the new conquerors. So, uh, so they have a whole different tradition uh, and they have their own scriptures. They have different old Testament. 
Yeah. And, <clears throat> and so th this creates all kinds of complexities. So I think the questioner is asking whether Christians today are bothered by the possibility that, that Christianity really was just an Essene sect. Uh, and I think there are Christians who have been bothered by this, but I think they're trying to find a way to spin it to their advantage. Um, <clears throat> so they still, you know, it's the idea that this, the last quest for the historical Jesus has been very big in pushing the fact that Jesus was a Jew. Uh, and so there's been a lot of, especially now with Zionism, we have like a lot of Christian Zionism, a lot of interest in emphasizing the Jewishness of Jesus because they want that political and social connection, uh, also because they want to convert Jews. But <laughs> they, they want to do that, um, but they still retain their distinctiveness by claiming that, that Jesus fulfilled or completed Judaism. So like, like yes, he's a Jew, but he's he ended the the bad form of Judaism and, and made the new proper religion. And so, so they're, they're still both able to anti-Semitically condemn Judaism as a false religion while at the same time treating it with reverence and, and respect overtly, right? This Minnesota nice right. uh, is, is what's going on here. Um, I, the answer to the question, I think, is they found a way to, to be comfortable with the Jewishness of Jesus. Although I should say I'm talking about scholars, uh, rank and file Christians, they might not even know this. <laughs> Right, so right. They right. might have a whole other, you know, uh, stages of grief to go through uh, if this if this ever became clear to them. Yeah. And if you if you actually go into Josephus's descriptions and he goes in depth about these three sects, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, if you actually look up what he says about the Essenes, it doesn't line up perfectly with Christians. There's a lot of things that they're doing that Christians aren't doing. Right. So I think you, I would agree with you that they pro it probably does come come from that sort of line. And also we need to distinguish Christians today from Christians then, or even Christians then from Christians post-Paul. Yeah. Because, because before Paul, Christianity was totally Jewish. Like it was, you had to circumcise, you had to follow dietary laws, you had to convert to Judaism to be a Christian. Uh, Paul changed all that, and that's you know well after Jesus, even if there was a Jesus. So um, yeah, just get circumcised. It's, it's in, right. It's so if you look at Christianity when it began, it looks a lot more like Essenism than than Christianity yeah. became later, right? So Christianity later got infused with Gentile Platonism and yeah. uh, anti-Semitism and Catholic, uh, you know, all its weird pagan stuff that it picked up. It's a radically different religion, you know. Jesus, neither Jesus nor Peter yeah. would recognize Catholic Christianity as anything they would ever have wanted to exist. Uh, but you know, that's Christianity for you. Leonard Mill with five dollars. Thank you for the super chat. He says, "Mandeism and Christianity, who influenced who?" I don't know the answer to this, uh, and the reason I don't is because we don't have sources that tell us the answer to this. So we only see references to Mandeism much later, like after Christianity is influencing everything. And by the time we get, we see Mandeism, it's heavily influenced by Christianity already. Right. So, so by sure. the time we actually see it, uh, it looks like something that grew out of Christianity. Now it is possible that there was a Mandeism that, that got influenced by Christianity that predates Christianity and possibly some Mandeism and found its way into Christianity early on. That's logically possible, but we have zero source texts to tell us this. So, so there's there's no way to know. Yeah, that's a good, good answer. Doc Plural Manat, thank you for the ten dollars. How do we navigate between the skilla of safeguarding academic freedom and the charid charibdis of charibdis? Yes, Charib of skilla Allah. and charibdis. Uh, I don't know if you know that's the uh, the rock and the whirlpool between um, Sicily and Italy that. Would, oh. you, you had to navigate carefully between them in, in legend, navigate carefully between them or your ship would be destroyed. Uh, yeah, so, okay. Right. And they were personified as deities. So they, they, they had a, a divine supernatural element. Oh, interesting. And so he says, and of not allowing that freedom to be co-opted by those promoting baseless viewpoints as scholarship. Yeah, a prominent example, which took place in the 80s and 90s, which was the debate between our creationists legitimate biologists <laughs> right uh so uh it, should you allow a biology professor to just spew creationist bullshit uh and um the, the the resolution that came out of that is no the answer is no um uh, unless they're specifically hired to do that uh so academic freedom yeah it became a question like to what extent do you allow total carte blanche to professors to preach anything whatever and and it's and especially with the concept of tenure 
which is a dying concept, like tenure is kind of going away as a thing, but, uh, but it was much more a thing then. The question is like, at what point do you say even tenure is not to be respected, that this person is no longer meeting their contractual obligations, and, and so we really have to get rid of them? Um, and, uh, and so there was some discussion in the 90s about what is the difference, legitimate difference between uh, pseudoscience and science between legitimate challenges to consensus and uh, uh, illegitimate ones, you know, crankery, basically. And so a lot of that got discussed in the 90s, even went as far as the Supreme Court in some respects. Um, so I think I, the answer is yes, we can navigate that. Uh, it's, it's complex and varies by field as to what our standards are. Um, but I think generally it starts with just being honest about what it is your school is doing. So if we're talking about like, we're talking about academic freedom, we're talking about professors and teachers. So we're talking about institutions, we're talking about schools. So if your school outright says, uh, oh, we are teaching biblical literalism. Uh, well, okay, at least you're being honest, right? And then then you can hire whoever you want and, and do it that way. And then if someone starts like preaching atheism and, and denigrating the mission of the school, obviously they've broken contract and they got to go teach somewhere else. Uh, and I think it, it becomes more about just being honest about what is the mission. And that was kind of the, the mission of secular schools or the mission of mainstream schools that would be accredited uh, by, you know, legitimate, or I should say, um, respected accreditation uh, uh, authorities. What would, there was this, the assumption uh, that, that came out of the 40s and 50s and 60s that uh, no one would do that, right? No, no one, no one would start spewing pseudoscience from the pulpit of a professorship when they were hired to teach science, right? Uh, but then they started doing it. And so then now they had to deal with this concept of like, oh, okay, now what do we do? Uh, and so it does come down to like, what, it, what actually, what did you sign on to do? What does your contract say that you're, you're supposed, what services are supposed to be performing here? And have we been honest with the public about what that contract said? Yep. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, David Fitzgerald, who did the book, Mything in Action. This I had about last night on my channel. Yeah. David's great. And his book is great. And he did this really, this thing that I'd always wish someone would do. And he did it really well, uh, in his first volume of Mything in Action. He got a bunch of people together. And they literally investigated like a thousand universities, I think, in North America, um, all the religious departments, every department of religion that there is. And they wanted what they wanted to find out was, is that do they sign a contract that says that they're not allowed to deviate from from literalism or, or whatever faith statement uh, they have? That, that, in other words, are they signing away their academic freedom uh, or what we would call their academic freedom? And a lot of schools tried to hide the fact that the answer was yes. Right. So so there's a lot of these professors who have who've basically signed sworn statements that they will never deviate in their teaching from what the dogma tells them they're supposed to preach and teach. Um, but then this is not communicated to the public. Right. Wow. It's not told to the students. Uh, and so that's where things start to become a problem. Right. Uh, and the same goes for any other ideological uh, issues like you just, you, there should be a clear agreement as to what is, what is my contract? What am I here to teach? What is the range of and gamut of my freedom? Uh, and then if, if that's unacceptable, don't teach there. Uh, but the second fact of that is that whatever those limits are, whatever the, whatever constraints we're putting on academic freedom need to be advertised. Like students who are going to that school need to know what school they're going to, like what kind of limitations in academic freedom are that are going on there? And are those limitations going to be methodological or not? Like it's, it's the difference between like, if you're a dick to your students, that's not an ideological issue. Uh, right. You can get fired over that for, for yeah. completely different reasons. Um, but are you being told that you cannot do something uh, for reasons other than ethics? So there's obviously there's science we can't do because it's unethical. Like there's a lot of human research that we just cannot do because it'd be grossly unethical to do that human research. And so that that's and that's again it's state it'll be stated in what what the human resources limits on research are like these are these are the things that we will not accept as, as for experimental research and stuff um so if it's stated and you can find it and it's it's clear what what our boundaries are then that's okay but when you're trying to hide these things or trying to be deliberately vague about them and use them to just get rid of anybody you don't like that's when things start to look political rather than um legitimate and i just have two more if you don't mind if you want to get to these real quick yeah let's do it Fire Sabers has says the DSC discussed this philo philosophical and religious conflicts between the followers of John the Baptist and the wicked priest. There appears to be a lot of parallels between TWP and Christ myth. Do you think they, they are early Christians? 
I don't know what these abbreviations refer to. The DSC. I'm not sure. TWP. Between the followers of John the Baptist and the wicked priest. Thank you for twenty dollars, by the way. I yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I can't answer this question because I don't I don't know what what's yeah, being asked here. Yeah, um, you can this, just. You, this I sounds can, like yeah. reference to materials that long postdate the origins of Christianity, uh, and philosophically, generally, that's useless. Uh, if if the source is not third century or Dead earlier, Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls. So oh, I see. Priests in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, there's no John the Baptist in the Dead Sea Scrolls. For sure. Uh, so, so that's obviously not. And the wicked priest is called something else. It's called like the the father of lies or something like that. It's, I don't think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember if there's a translation by which you could just phrase it, wicked priest. I, sure. I haven't looked into that, but um, but there's no John the Baptist in there. Um, but there is a discussion of of you know villainous people, and and they seem to be highly mythologized or highly um, cosmically charged discussions. Um, there's no direct connections to Christianity. Uh, that I've found in my research, so I've not deep dived them for that reason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so the next one is Sword of Marduk, four ninety nine. Thank you. Appreciate that. What do you know about the history of the canonicity of Revelation, and was John of Padmos the Apostle John? I don't think any mainstream scholar thinks that he was. Uh, I think pretty much everybody agrees. I mean, fundamentalists aside, you know, Christian apologists aside, uh, but mainstream scholars um, concur that John of Patmos is someone else, um, and and it is not the apostle. Um, yeah. And certainly, it's unlikely anyway. Uh, the Revelation would have been written in the eighties uh, A.D. It's extremely unlikely that anyone would still be alive uh, who was an apostle in the thirties A.D. Uh, regarding the canonicity, uh, I don't get. Uh, I don't get embroiled in canonicity debates because that's a theological dispute that's uh, I find petty and trivial. Uh, for, as a historian, my only interest in is when was it written, who wrote it, what was it for? <laughs> like that's uh, uh, so canonicity is a whole religious theological decision uh, that different churches make. Uh, it does appear to have been folded into the proto canon from the first, probably the first edition of the New Testament. Um, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, I have an article on the three things to know about new testament manuscripts you can, that's the title and you can find that article on um, my website richardcarrier.info and i talk about david trobish's book the first edition of the new testament where he basically proves uh, through paleological analysis that all the manuscripts that we have even the scraps that go way back they all derive from a single edition where all these books were compiled together and basically marketed as a unit uh, in the middle of the second century and this collection wasn't official, like no, no one canonized it. No one, there was no committee that said this is the one true Bible or anything like that. Just someone did it. Uh, and then that edition became very popular. And that edition is what underlies the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, which I think both have revelation in them. I'm not positive. I haven't checked that. Um, but I'm pretty sure it, it seems to have been bundled with this unit from very early on. So mid second century. So that means when the four gospels were folded together, and the epistles were folded in with the gospels. Revelation was tacked on with it uh, at the same time. As opposed to, for example, the long ending of Mark, uh, which clearly was not in this edition. That was something that got added later, um, for example. Yeah. And uh, I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure if Marcion's canon had that in there. I don't remember either. Yeah. But um, but yeah. I, I, would, I would doubt it. But uh, there, there are reasons why I, Marcion wouldn't like that book. Um, but Christian apologists can do amazing things with books they don't like. So that's never a, a solid reason for them to reject one. <clears throat> um, yeah. And the last thing I wanted to do, just because this person gave $20, he, uh, he left a comment saying he meant the uh, scenes, not the followers. Oh, people. okay. I see. Wait. So I think that changes things a little bit. I think he's saying, do you think the scenes were early Christians? Um, and the wicked priest, yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it early Christians, right? So the way to talk about it would be, <clears throat> here's a possible scenario. I'm not saying this is true. I'm saying that this would fit the evidence and it, it could have happened. Uh, you have the Essenes. You have some, one or more sects of the Essenes at Qumran. That's the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those are the people who wrote those or kept those uh, books. Um, and so let's say they're Essenes. We don't know that for sure, but let's say they are. 
Uh, and then you have Peter, who maybe probably was in that sect, but broke away to start his own breakaway sect of it. Uh, and because he was preaching that no, the end's going to come any time now. I know the truth, and disagrees with the leader of the the Dead Sea Scrolls, and still goes and starts his own faction of Essenes. And then eventually he has the revelation: is that Christ has come and done this thing, or Jesus comes along and join, and he gloms onto Jesus and basically uses Jesus uh, for his own purposes. Either way, uh, that would be a, an example of where Christianity would grow out of Essenism. It would be. Uh, basically a, a revolution, uh, what's called a revolution sect within the tr tradition of Essenism. It's entirely possible um, and, and would fit the evidence. We just can't, we just don't have the sources we need to prove that that's what happened. All right. Well, um, the last, this is the last second one. And you can, I promise this is the last one. A tad wonky, but was the inverted text sw sown, sorry, in the Codex Panoptimus, the Apocalypse of Peter mentioned in the Moratorian Canon and by Clement? Yeah, Panapolitanus. Um, well, I haven't looked into this, so I, I don't. I don't know what that. I don't know what answer to give them. Um, but but yeah, the, the, there's. This is a later. This is a later manuscript um, from which we drive what's called the Apocalypse of Peter, which is a much, uh, which is a later text. Um, so say, so, was the inverted text of the oh, the sorry. Apocalypse of Peter mentioned in the Muratorian Canon and by Clement? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know what the mainstream consensus is either on that, or even if we know the answer to that question. It's possible it's unanswerable, um, but it's not something I've looked into, so I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the place to look would be, um, for example, the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church would probably have like some of the, it, it would summarize what the uh, mainstream consensus position is on that, uh, I think. Uh, that, would, that would be one place to look. Or Aaron's dictionary of the Bible might might have that. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Good point. And uh, just for everyone knows, the links in the description for Dr. Carrier. Throw him a donation. Throw him five bucks if you got it. Throw him something. You know, he comes here and he gives us all his all his wonderful <laughs> knowledge. And uh, I'm about to play the outro. You, I kept you past your time, so you could just, you don't have to wait for this to be over. So oh, that's fine. No, I I'll hang out until you're done. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank <laughs> you. And uh, everyone else, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained True Gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you.